production of Tomorrow's World. Welcome to our darkened studio. Dark so that we can be switched on to the very latest in fashion. Sparkly, isn't it? Thanks to the 88,000 optical fibres that are built into this jacket and linked to a light box with a rotating filter so the colours change in sequence. We've got a red Rio at the moment because this, the very first example of fibre optic fashion in the world, has been specially made by a London designer for the New Year Rio Carnival in Brazil. The light is brightest where you actually see the ends of the optical fibres and it's softer where you get the fibres running down. Now, while this may work very well on a carnival float in Rio, I think it's going to be some time before they can reduce the size of this little lot so we can all see our way in the dark. In the rest of the programme, I visit a house which is going underground and we join the Isle of Man fire service to see how magnets can fight a fire. But first, how to get a better view of the fish. What happens when a tank like this breaks? Not much fun for us or for the fish. But the problem is that to keep an aquarium absolutely safe, the panes of glass have got to be able to withstand a pressure of nearly 800 pounds per square foot. And if you're using ordinary glass, then the panes have got to be small with partitions every couple of feet. And that's hardly ideal for the panoramic view. So the owners of this aquarium, which is already the largest in the UK, want to build a bigger and better tank with a clear view through panels of glass which are four metres by two metres, three times this size. The question is how? Well, in Germany, Aquaria use this very thick, ordinary glass. Now, the trouble with that is it's extremely heavy and makes everything you see through it green and magnified. On the other hand, in America, they use an acrylic, which is light and gives superb optics whilst it's new. But half the fun of going to the aquarium is getting as close to the fish as possible. And with lots of people and fish pushing against the sides of the tank, it very quickly gets scratched and you end up looking through one big blur. But now it seems the British may have come up with the answer. It's made of toughened glass, like windscreens. It's thin, light and very strong. But even toughened glass can break. And when it does, it really goes. So here, there are two layers laminated together. And each one alone is capable of withstanding the pressure inside the tank, even if it were a four by two metre panel. So where's the catch? Ah, oh, Ian, my brave man. Now, hopefully there's not going to be a catch because Ian's going to be inside the tank when we smash it. All right, lads, fill it up to the top. 500 gallons of confidence. In theory, the reason Ian can sit safely in the tank is that even when the outside pane's broken, the inside one shouldn't be affected and should remain to hold him and the water inside. Now, the thing is, this has never been tested before. If it works, it means we'll have the first mega aquarium in Britain by next summer. And if it doesn't, it's back to the drawing board. Right, let's go for it. I think I'll stand over here.
Cheers, well done. A smashing success. This is Karim. He's five years old and quite old enough to want to go out and play. Off you go then, go on. But unfortunately, he's still young enough to be vulnerable when he disappears out of sight of his parents. Last year, in London alone, nearly a thousand children went missing for two days or more. And all because, of course, it's impossible to watch a child all the time. Now, there can never be any substitute for keeping a watchful eye on your child yourself. But we've equipped Karim with an American device which could perhaps give his parents some peace of mind. The secret lies in this transmitter here, attached to his belt, which is emitting pulses of radio waves. And those pulses are picked up on this receiver. And as long as it continues to pick up a signal, then nothing happens. If, for any reason, though, the strength of the signal received should fall below a certain level, then I'd know about it. And the further that uh, Maggie takes Kareem away from me, the weaker the signal becomes until the alarm sounds. Now, that was set on the low range, which, as you can see, only allowed Kareem to travel about 30 feet or so. But there are two other positions which he can be set to, which would allow him the freedom of a rather longer leash, up to, say, around 150 feet. But moving out of range isn't the only thing that sets it off. It's fail-safe. Anything which stops the pulse of signals for more than 12 seconds will sound the alarm. So if a stranger should remove it, a tiny micro-switch underneath the clip will set it off. And on the subject of clips, maybe this could do with being a little bit stronger to prevent false alarms. There's also a panic button on the front, so providing the child remembers, he can call for help himself. And Kareem is going to assist me with a little experiment here, because if he was playing near a fish pond, have you got it? That's it. Take it over there. Right down the bottom of the garden, out of sight, and the worst thing possible happened, well, they've got that one covered too. Yeah, it didn't even break our fish tank, did it? And I'd certainly know about that as well. But being warned is only the first step. The American designers plan soon to incorporate a homing device so that a parent can actually find their wayward youngster. It's unlikely to arrive in this country for some time, particularly since, uh, hello, it's off again, since British experts are anxious that some parents may be lulled into a false sense of security. They stress that there's no substitute for a watchful parental eye. And now Bob Symes with another report in his series of inventors and their prototypes. They say there's no smoke without fire. That may be so, but there certainly is no fire without smoke. It's an important distinction because the poisonous smoke that a fire produces is what often kills people, even at some distance from the actual flames. There were no flames in this case because it was simply a smoke exercise for the Manx Fire Brigade. But I'm here on the Isle of Man to have a look at an idea which might slam the door on the smoke hazard for good. No, this is not a TARDIS. This glass cage was specially designed to test how smoke can leak around doors. One of the biggest problems is smoke that's moved away from the actual fire. It cools down, it remains poisonous nonetheless, but it sinks to the ground and that's where most doors have their biggest gaps. Even a simple draft excluder might help to stop the smoke from spreading. But inventor Frank Thompson built this rig to help him develop his super seal. So I asked Frank to demonstrate the problem. A standard marine flare rapidly fills the chamber with a sort of dense smoke that Frank is concerned with. Being sealed, the chamber is quite free of drafts. Even so, smoke is soon billowing round the door. 
That looks jolly ominous. Let's see how you seal can cope with it. But before we do that, let's get some of this smoke out. Come on. This is the prototype of Frank's new seal. It's really rather simple. It's all done with magnets. And it's on the principle that like poles push each other apart and unlike poles attract each other, a sort of magnetic spring. And here it is in the open position. The magnets, like poles, you can see them here, pushing each other apart. The door is now open and the seal is retracted. When the door hits the jam, this little lever pushes the top bar across and unlike poles face each other and what happens is the seal is dropped. Watch this. Well, Frank, how much are these going to cost, these seals, when you market them? Well, they won't cost any more than £10. There's three, three different types of seal. There's an external one, an internal one, and one, hopefully, we can have the manufacturers fit direct into the doors. Well, let's try it out. For my money, I think Frank Seal would sell well as an upmarket draft excluder, and that's the market he should go for. A draft excluder that also excludes smoke. Well, it certainly does work. All Frank has to do now is persuade some of the door manufacturers to fit it. And if he does, he might save somebody's life with it. And what's more, provide some much needed engineering employment here on the island. it emerged that President Reagan is determined to press ahead with Star Wars research and for the moment he and Gorbachev have had to agree to differ about it. But Britain has been rather left behind in the space race since our Blue Streak Space Launcher project was scrapped 20 years ago. This week the government took an important step in getting us back in that race. It appointed Ray Gibson, former head of the European Space Agency, to run a new British National Space Centre which would coordinate all of our space missions both military and civilian. And he'll be evaluating projects such as this, the British Space Platform, which would run alongside the proposed American Space Station in the 1990s. And how about this, a revolutionary new idea of a space launcher, the HOTOL, or Horizontal Takeoff and Landing Vehicle, designed for the next century. It would really be one large fuel tank full of liquid hydrogen at the front and liquid oxygen at the back. And on takeoff, it would leave its undercarriage behind, then accelerate to five times the speed of sound into space, launching a seven-ton payload. Its supporters believe it could get satellites into orbit at half the price charged by the American Space Shuttle or the French Ariane rocket. It could take passengers too. Then it could return to Earth, say to Australia, in under an hour, using a smaller set of wheels to land. A leading expert on child health called on the government tonight to make a drug available on the NHS which might prevent spina bifida. Professor Richard Smithles of Leeds University made his plea after receiving the Harding Award for services to the disabled this evening. Many doctors believe that the drug, a vitamin supplement called Pregnavite 40F, can prevent women who've had one or more spina bifida babies having further handicapped children. But since April, it's not been available on the NHS. And there's such concern in some quarters that today, the Labour MP, Mrs Gwyneth Dunwoody, tabled a Commons question asking the government to allow the drug to be prescribed once again on the NHS. These developments are the latest twist in a 10-year controversy surrounding the drug, which has split the medical profession. Since 1976, Professor Smithles and his team have given high-risk mothers in their care the mixture of vitamins, minerals and folic acid. And their results suggest that the drug does reduce the number of handicapped babies. But some doctors criticised his work as unscientific and inconclusive because there was no control group, that is, a group of high-risk mothers who weren't given the drug to compare with the mothers who were. 
ethical committees took the view that it would be wrong to deprive high-risk mothers of a drug which might help. Then, three years ago, the Medical Research Council announced that it would conduct a large-scale trial, including such a control group, in spite of these doubts. There are two problems, however. The trial has got off to a slow start, partly because of adverse publicity and partly because some doctors still consider that such a trial is unethical. Of the 2,000 high-risk mothers needed, only 528 have so far agreed to join the trial, and the majority of those are from overseas. The organisers estimate that it will be another three years at least before the trial is concluded, and in the meantime, the drug can't be obtained on NHS prescription. But when you remember that the incidence of spina bifida is higher in this country than anywhere else in the world, you can understand why feelings run so high. Westenbert House was built in the mid-19th century by Captain Robert Holford. The captain was a man who had a strong dislike for the Victorian architecture of his time, choosing instead this late Renaissance style. But he had even stronger views on his gardens, spending a lot of time and money on extending his grounds, introducing what were then exotic plants, and planning his now famous arboretum. He wanted nothing to interrupt his glorious views. Even boundary walls and hedges were banned. Hence this, called a ha-ha, because according to the dictionary, this sunken fence surprises and makes one cry, ha-ha, <laughs> enough of that. Now, Captain Holford also didn't want to see a single cottage from his mansion, but that was more difficult to arrange. In fact, the captain had to demolish the existing village and rebuild it in a specially excavated hollow and now, a hundred years later, history's repeating itself. The ha-ha lives again. Because the man who owned this mere three-quarters of an acre of land was refused permission to build on it. The local authority, taking the place of the landowner, declared yet again that a house would spoil the view. So the owner started to excavate the area, just like Robert Holford had ordered. But was there a better way to camouflage his house? Well, he decided to build it in the hollow, but then to cover it over again. Planning permission was granted for an underground house, the ultimate ha-ha. Not surprisingly, the house has some rather quirky features, so a computer was summoned to help with the plans. An architectural graphics computer just like this is being used to help in the reconstruction of the Statue of Liberty, so it ought to be able to cope with an underground house. But this house isn't just underground, it's also a very complicated egg shape. But this really does help. These 3D pictures mean that you can explain all sorts of things. And the more realistic pictures that this computer can generate meant the builders could visualise details accurately. The arches over the entrance, for example, were made slightly flatter to match the overall egg shape of the house. And things like the pillars were experimented with. And there are so many other possibilities with this machine. You can use pictures like this to plan your lighting. You can look at pictures from different angles and decide where to put your furniture. And you can also do a lot of interesting things to plan your colour schemes. Once he'd seen it here, the owner of the site felt he was going to end up with a home he'd really want to live in. Small rooms lead off the central living area, all bathed in light from skylights and occasional windows where the hillside is cut away. Well, that's what it should be like, but everything looks different on the ground. At the moment, the house is clearly in the early stages of construction, but at least the bare bones of the structure are revealed, showing how different underground houses have to be. For a start, huge columns and all these thick walls are needed to support an earth-covered roof that will weigh at least five times as much as a traditional tiled roof. 
Now, you couldn't be blamed for thinking that any underground house is bound to be damp and cold. But in fact, it's quite the reverse. Water's trapped outside the building and channeled away in pipes. And the outer walls will be sealed with a double layer of a new tough and waterproof polyurethane coating. The temperature inside the house will vary by less than one degree centigrade, whatever the conditions outside. And that's because the blanket of earth provides excellent insulation. There's also a small pool just here. It acts as a small swimming pool, but also helps to maintain even temperatures because it acts as a heat store. It should take less than a quarter of the energy used by a well-insulated traditional house to keep this underground den snug and warm. But what would the captain have said? Ha ha. Hang on, I'll be right with you. I'm just trying to achieve inner peace. This is part of a system based on biofeedback. Now, biofeedback is about uh, using machines to measure biological responses and then learning to control those responses. And uh, this equipment over here is, is showing my brain waves along with some other studio interference. And it's an example of what I'm talking about. Waves of electrical impulses move constantly across the brain. And the sort of waves it produces varies depending on what state of mind you're in. It's been found that when you relax, you produce alpha waves. Now, people can learn to produce alpha waves at will, and that can help to lower blood pressure, relieve migraine headaches, and reduce stress. Now, you'd normally use a system like this, an electrocephalogram to measure brain waves, and a loudspeaker, which makes a purer sound when you're producing the right waves. Well, doing it well requires quite a lot of practice. And the problem is how to motivate yourself to sit here and do it. Listening to this hissing sound isn't exactly a barrel of laughs, and it's not very relaxing either. So how about this? It's part of a new system designed to help busy executives reduce stress. It measures alpha waves and muscle tension. When I relax, all my muscles generate alpha waves, and a switch in here is triggered that allows the train to run. Right, well, let's see if it actually works. I'll switch it on and then uh, relax and see if I can get the old alpha waves going. And then when I wake up, the train stops, and then if I can go back to sleep again. Pretty good, eh? And as you see, uh, when you get good at it, you can make the train run constantly, and the sound is more soothing than that hissing. It's strangely really because the secret of doing it is not to try to do it. Well, their latest idea is to make biofeedback really portable. For the executive who has everything, including hypertension, what about this? These are uh, contacts measure the uh, electrical conductivity of my skin. So I'll just put it on and put this onto green, just in between. And then if I sort of hyperventilate like that, try and, try and get myself excited, it turns red. Now then, well, if you want to, you can plug this into any sort of electrical appliance, in this case, this lamp behind me, and on it comes. So now I have to try and make it go off. So uh, lads, if you just dim the lights and uh, leave me in peace, I'll get on to my work. It's right up my street, this. The less I try, the better I get. Before we go, if you were dazzled by my jacket, just take a look at my feet. Fibre optics can now be tufted into carpets so that you really get the message. It's obviously a good moment to leave. So until next week, good night. <laughs> <laughs>